Do you believe in accountable love? Welcome to Accountable Love, Home of the Love Snarls, where love is a group journey. My name is Aziz. I'm Jerry. And, and today, today we have the rail. As our special guest. <laughs> who just who just slid the camera over because we had a guest <laughs> uh, on the guest star. Uh, but you know, we're gonna talk to him about accountable love and being an adult in the room. <laughs> Home of the love snobs, love snobs, love snobs. The love snobs have surfaced. You know, the people that actually use honesty to communicate. The genuine friends that refuse to let you feel sorry for yourself. Yes, those people. You know, the friends that collect your tears every time life makes your eyes ring. The love snobs, the people that don't allow you to settle. Support your dreams, but don't support you sleeping with just anybody. You know, the friends that are so judgmental, they actually stay away from negative people and encourage you to surround yourself with positive people. Yes, that friend. The friends that love you even when you refuse to love yourself. You, you know, know, the, the love, love snobs. snobs. Okay, so, the rail, what does it... What does accountable love mean to you? You know, we always start our discussions off with asking that question for anybody who's a new guest. So, you know, let us know what accountable love means to you. Yeah, yeah, number one, what's going on? Thank y'all for having me. Um, accountable love to me means, you know, two people coming together for a common goal and being able to hold each other accountable when things go wrong, things go right, common theme, things like that. So if, if we're in this journey together, I'm holding you accountable. You're holding me accountable, and we're and we're going to do this thing to move forward. Okay, that's 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 what's up. So you know, this is season three. The first season we defined our term. Second season, you know, we introduced the world to the love jobs. And um, this season we're talking about the adult in the room. So when you hear the being the adult in the room, what do you think of? Um, being an adult in the room. Being an adult in the room means to me, means I'm going to take the good with the bad. I'm going to take the bad with the good, no matter what the situation is. Um, you know, I'm going to hold myself and hold my partner to a certain standard. Okay. Okay. What's up? So we, you know, we always hear, so I know in your last statement, you said the bad and the good. What distinguishes between actually dating just anybody because everybody has bad and everybody has good so if you accept the badge wouldn't you you know typically date anybody if that's the uh -huh. case so now like i'm hearing what you're saying um no you don't like no you don't just date anybody you choose the people you date um all right uh so you know you seek a partner you choose a partner um and and obviously most of the time you would um pick a partner that would be compatible with you and, and that you're willing to build with. So yeah, so that's how I think about that. But when you think of good and bad within a relationship, like what would be something good, like what, what, what do you consider something good or something bad? Like bad enough for you to work through it and not, you know, second guess what's going on. Or not even um, second guess, make a decision basically. Uh, something that, okay. So for example, if a person is, on a substance, that would not be a situation that I would be willing to work with. You know what I'm saying? Okay. saying? That's What's a deal breaker. Let's be clear with substance. Give us some some examples of Okay. Substance. I mean, for me, smoking would be an, uh, like, let's just say uh, a tobacco or weed or something like that. That would be a deal breaker for me because I don't smoke, so I wouldn't want to date anybody that does smoke. Okay. Okay. That's the only substance? I mean, <laughs> heroin, uh, you know, crack, you know what I'm saying, acid, stuff like that, like hard drugs, that would be a no-brainer for me that I would not accept. So alcohol is, is cool? Alcohol would be all right with me, yes. Yeah. How frequent could they they drink? Socially fine. I mean, I, I would want to uh, be with someone who drinks every single day, has to wake up and drink, has to go to work and drink, has to sneak drink. No. That's an alcoholic, so no, that wouldn't be a, um, I would not be able to date someone who was an alcoholic. So define socially, you know, because we have viewers, we have people that listen, and we, you know, yeah. we want to be clear, 
you know, we like to educate, we like to inform, so we want, want to make sure all the messages are clear and you're coming off, you know, as clear as possible. Right. Uh, for me, I mean, a person that drinks on, like, drinks on weekends, I don't see a problem with that. Um, I don't see a problem with a weekend drinker. To me, that's social. So every weekend they can drink? Uh, that wouldn't bother me, no. Okay, that's smooth. So you touched on deal breakers. Um, so is that a conversation that you have? At what point when you're meeting someone, whether it's romantic or friendship, because deal breakers go across the board, or at, they should, right? They should be reflected in every relationship, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. However, I do know that when it comes to an intimate partner, someone that a romantic partner, there's certain things that you're definitely, like you may could hang out with someone who smokes, but keep them at a distance, right? They may not necessarily be a friend, they may be an associate, they may not come to your house, but you may, you may kick it with them every so often, right? But what yeah. are your, what, when you talk about your deal breakers, at what point in the relationship do you, do you have that conversation? I think you have that conversation within the first couple of days. Um, as far as a romantic partner, I think if you're meeting someone, like say I met someone last night and we started to, you know, dialogue on the phone, you know what I'm saying, the following day or for that week, I think within that first week, you need to get your deal breaker stuff out. Within the first week, you would know that I'm, I wouldn't date anybody that smoked because that would be a straight up deal breaker. Okay. And what about just so that's like you, you're really cool with somebody at work or you meet, you know, uh, a, you meet a friend, um, you meet someone that could be a possible friend, at what point in that relationship are you talking about deal breakers? Say that one more time, sorry. I said when you, so you, you establish a romantic partner, right? So what about someone who's just a friend? At what um, point are you guys discussing deal breakers? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question because I know I have several friends who, um, who I hang around with on occasion that that that, that they definitely smoke. Um, and kind of what I do is, I, and, and I don't even say anything, I kind of remove myself from the room, especially when it starts to bother me and things like that. Um, yeah, that, that's what I would do. So, okay, so, so to answer your question, I think I'm more inclined to tell someone who I'm trying to date romantically how I feel about them as far as what I'm able to deal with and not deal with as opposed to a, as opposed to a friend who I see on occasion. I, I do definitely see the, you know, like the differences of the two, but I just think that's, that's well, me right now, I think that's the direction I would go with. If, if I'm romantic with you, it'll be within the first week. You know, if, if we're just acquaintances, there's probably some things that will let slide because of, because of what the situation is. Well, yeah, I think that, you know, we are taught that, you know, friends are, when you think of priorities, they're not on the, the higher tier of the priorities, right? So mm -hmm. there's not a like, so basically when we're connecting with people, we're not really thinking about those things per se, unless they're really putting our life in danger, right? But if it's just something like a vice, like smoking cigarettes or smoking weed or drinking or whatever the case may be, um, we may let that slide, but our significant other, we don't. But I learned over time that everything should mirror each other. So what you expect in your significant other, you should expect in your friend, mm -hmm. who you call your friend. Like the people that you see on occasion, are, are they really your friends, right? They're, they're probably acquaintances. They're not really friends, right? So the people that you truly call your friends, like if you don't want your girl, you know, smoking and drinking, I mean, drinking, be smoking weed or cigarettes or whatever the case may be, then how could you allow your homeboy to come over and, 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 and spark up a cigarette? And you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't really, it doesn't really go together. I, I learned that over, the, over time as well because we, put less pressure on our friends and more pressure on our significant others. And I get it, like we're building a different life with them, right? And we're intimate, so we're kissing and we're doing all these things that we're not necessarily doing with our friends. So someone that smokes cigarettes, that's like, I don't want to kiss you because you're smoking cigarettes, you know what I mean? Right. Um, so the friends, you're like, we don't kiss whatever. We're not that, we're not physically that close. So it's not, it shouldn't be that big a deal, but it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I just, I mean, just hearing you talk, like, like I said, I, I, I never, and I should moving forward decipher between the two is just, I'm more inclined to accept and, um, and uh, tolerate. That's the word I should use. I'm more, you know, privy to tolerate certain things when we're not in a romantic relationship. But to like, but hearing you speak and 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 understanding what you're saying, I should be doing that across the board. 
And I mean, I mean, for viewers listening, I don't think I'm the only one that does that. I think we tend to tolerate things with 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 uh, with acquaintances as opposed to our romantic partners. It's just something I might have to work on in the future. Like I never really thought about it like that until you just said that. Well, I see in your language that you're using acquaintances and friends in the same yeah the same tier, but. Friends are people who you navigate through life with that share your core values, share your principles, that, you know, can hold you accountable, you hold them accountable. Acquaintances are more at a distance, so the accountability is not as as strong because they didn't sign up for anything further than, you know, meeting up more yeah. often. Maybe, you know, they're talking about business ideas, maybe talking about work, maybe you know, just shooting the breeze, maybe playing basketball with versus somebody who's your friend. You know what I mean? Y'all leaving the basketball court together. Y'all leaving work together. Y'all actually spending time together. Y'all actually make plans, not just plans for the day, but plans for life together. You, you got to the kids, so yeah. If they don't have y'all, y'all, y'all um, morals and y'all principles and the things that are deal breakers to you on the line, I mean, how could you help them with their children? How could you be supportive? And they need it the most if y'all, you know, if y'all don't share the same principles and core values, how could you hold them accountable? Yeah, I mean, I mean, no doubt. Um, I think, um, and then I think back of what I've been saying on our on our Monday chats uh, of how I've had to uh, decipher certain friends and leave certain people behind. I think I'm still caught up sometimes, not all the time. I think I'm still caught up between making acquaintances, friends, and or not. And I think that's something I need to work on. Oh, so you you're working on your vocabulary right now? Absolutely. Like changing changing the way you structure your vocabulary, changing the way you communicate, so you're a lot clearer and you know the roles people play in your life. Absolutely. Um, I think um, I mean, I think a lot of people, if you don't take your you take your relationship serious, I think a lot of us get caught up in the title of having acquaintances and kind of looping them in together with friends, especially when you use the word tolerate and, and which. Within, within regards which you're willing to tolerate and which you're not willing to tolerate. Well, I'm glad you brought up, the, you said tolerate again, because that's another thing that, you know, when most people, to, when, when you tolerate something, eventually that breeds resentment, right? Like you, you I personally would never want to be tolerated. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain things that, I mean, I, I, there's things I'm sure that I have things about me that people don't like, like pet peeves or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's what I would say, like, you kind of, depending on what it is, you take the good with the bad. Like, say I chew with my mouth open. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like something like that. Like, so yeah, you, I, in essence, you're like kind of, you're tolerating the fact that I chew, but if that's, you, you tolerate the fact that I chew with my mouth open every time we eat. However, if that's something that you really don't like, you know what I mean? And then you're, 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 you're and every time you're, I'm eating in front of you, all that's going to do is really breed resentment. So I do think that everyone should go out and get the relationships, the connections, everything that they want, right? And you shouldn't really tolerate because or you should really understand that this is what the person, this is what the person brings to the table, this is who they are, and I accept them for that, even though it may be annoying at times. You know what I mean? Because when you're tolerating it, it's just, you're, it's like you're, you're buying time until that one day you look over like, hey, what your mouth goes? You know what I mean? Like, you're at that point. So... I know when someone tells me, you could, you could always, you always know when somebody's tolerating you. Nobody really says it. Um, it's sometimes like a conversation that I bring up, like, I know that you don't like this down the third. Like, I, you know, I believe that you're tolerating me. Um, I know I personally don't like, I, I don't like being tolerated. Um, I want everyone to be in my life because that's where they truly want to be. Um, and I don't know about you, but when you say tolerate, like, how long do you think you could tolerate a person that you have in your life long term. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it definitely does build resentment. And we were on a topic of smoking, um, and I and, and I see myself like seeing myself putting myself in situations like I'm like um, the person who I'm trying to build a life with, which we, which I should be trying to build a life with all my friends, and I understand that. But as far as the word tolerate, so I guess you know you're hanging out with certain people, and then after a while. You know, you smell the cigarette smoke or you smell the tobacco smoke and then you start saying things like, can you please put that away or can you please not smoke around me? My, it's the ninth, tenth time that we've been hanging around each other now I'm starting to have a problem with. It. So I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. That, that's something that should have been uh, 
addressed? Yeah, some yeah, so that's something that should have been addressed the first first second time. So I definitely understand what you're saying. Definitely like I mean, we even look at the word tolerance as something we do with our neighbors, something we do with people that we're not trying to even build personal relationships with because they do have to share the earth with us and we have to be tolerant of people's differences. Mm -hmm. But like we said, and you know, our let's talk relationships on Monday at 9 p.m. We were um, talking about, you know, the fact that we shouldn't tolerate somebody in a personal relationship because we're choosing that relationship. So what's happening is you have the discussion, come to agreement, and you just make decisions on whether, you know, y'all can move forward with the relationship based on the things you don't like or the things they don't like, mm -hmm. things of that nature. But once you move forward, you're saying the pros outweigh the cons. So you're not tolerant, you're accepting of the fact that this person does this and you're saying that, okay, this pro, this con is not that big because the pros mm -hmm. are far outweigh those things which is yeah. greater than tolerance, it's acceptance. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like now we don't have to talk about that anymore because I already accepted the fact that you're gonna do this and you're gonna continue doing this because you're convicted in it. And I have accepted the fact that I'd rather be with you and ha rather have you in my life than not have you in my life. Right. So we're gonna allow this to go down and this is an agreement. You know, and that goes back to, you know, the definition of the adult in the room. So we started off really saying, okay, the good and the bad, and like, what are you saying about the bad? And can you be cool with anybody? The adult in the room has to make a decision. We look at the adult in the room as a leader. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you're telling your children to graduate to being adults, you're ultimately saying, taking on the responsibility of their decision making, mm -hmm. everything that comes with it. And being able to accept the consequences that come with your decision making. So being the adult in the room is the person that is unafraid to make decisions, unafraid to live with the consequences, and unafraid to, you know, actually accept the role that they play in people's lives and, you know, live, live up to that role to the fullest, you know? Everybody's right. not geared to be a leader in everybody's life. You yeah. know what I mean? But they know that they play a, a, a big role in, the, the, in, in the, a person's life. That's why we connect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So they, they live up to that end. They're into the bargain. They live up to all their agreements. They're very responsible. They're accountable. And, you know, they're the adult in the room. They're the ones that's going to hold you accountable when you're going wrong. They're the person who's going to support you when you're doing something right. They're the person who's going to, you know, be transparent and expect you to be transparent as well. You get what I'm saying? Right, no doubt. So at the end of the day, I mean, so according to your, well, according to the definition or the notion of being an adult in the room, there could be multiple adults in the room at one time, correct? Definitely. Yes, absolutely. Because leadership, people think of leadership as... Oh, Martin Luther King, you know, yeah, he's a leader and he displays leadership qualities, you know what I mean? But everybody that helped him get to that point, secretaries, you know what I mean? Wives, his wife. All his support. It, all his support system. If they didn't, they weren't aligned and they didn't play their roles as strongly as they, they could, they did play their roles, he couldn't be who he was. Right. You know what I'm sure. saying? So they all were adults and they all were leaders and they all sacrificed for a greater good. They all agree, okay, we're gonna take on this this struggle of, you know, commonality to make sure that we actually affect change in, in, in life. You know what I'm saying? So without all of them really buying into their role, without breeding resentment, and obviously we don't know the int integral details of every last thing that, the intricate details of every last thing that went on. But the point is, we know that the support was there. And we know that because people showed up when they said they was going to show up, the movement was a lot more powerful. Mm -hmm. Everybody that showed up to that movement and was accountable for showing up to that movement and sacrificed their comfort for that movement, they was adults in the room. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, there could definitely be multiple adults. Know your role, play your role, and accept your role. Don't be envious of other people's roles and don't look over your shoulders. If you want to be a leader and you're already attached to a leader, Nine times out of ten, you got to start your own organization. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So you can't be envious and trying to take somebody's spot. You Everything's about support because everybody leads in one facet of every last relationship, every last interaction. You know what I mean? Everything that they do, you're going to have a leadership role in those in that understanding. Just because Martin Luther King was the figurehead doesn't mean he was the, the voice necessarily. You get what I'm saying? Somebody else could have wrote his speeches. You know what I mean? You never know what's going on behind the scenes. You just know the figurehead 
or the actor. Like the director, you never know who the director is unless you're into movies. Mm -hmm. But you know the actors. Yeah. But the director is the true leader, you know, on the set. So sometimes the leader's not seen. So you do know what leadership is. You do know the roles you play, but the actors show up and play their roles, which allow them to be leaders in their own right. Right. You get what I'm saying? So we're now looking at leadership differently and we're making leadership synonymous with being an adult. And that doesn't breed envy. That breeds accepting the roles you play in your relationship. Yeah, that, that's really that's a really important point, actually. Because when you think of leadership, you think of someone being at the head of everything. Right. But being able to be mature enough to say that this person leads in this area better than I do. So I, I'm not going to be in the... I'm not going to be the first person in line. I may be the second or third, but whatever role I'm playing, I'm, I, I, whatever role I have, I'm going to make sure that I fill it to the fullest. Yeah, like but. on a personal level, how did that, like, let's say that framework, if you now use that mindset, let's say in your marriage, how would that have changed, you think? You know what I mean? Like, you know, just open up, like, let us know. We're not saying all the details, but basically, you know, give us an absence of, you know, what, what actually was strong in the marriage, what actually broke down in the marriage, and how that functioned. And how that I mean, worked. yeah, no doubt. Um, with me, um, there's certain things that I can talk about as far as, like, um, let's just talk about money, right? I knew that going into, you know what I'm saying, my marriage, when I was married, that, you know, my spouse was a better person at handling money. Um, so, but I guess at a certain point, I felt like I was okay with it and I wanted to either help out or kind of take that, take that over and not necessarily step on toes, but kind of let her know that I can do this too, where I've grown in this area and that kind of caused friction too. So mm -hmm. I guess my question to you and your viewers would be, so what do you do when you feel like you weren't the strong person at the beginning? but you feel like you're okay now and you can help and you can contribute, but that person doesn't kind of want to let you do that. And that definitely can cause pressure to me because I've been through that. How would you go about handling that? Well, I think that, so I guess it would be, we, you start with the conversation, right? So you believe that you're in a better place to manage the money, right? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean that she's going to hand over the rings to you. Um, I think that you should go in knowing that, you know what I mean? I think that, you have to sit back and think, what's your intention? Are you trying to prove a point? Or at this point, are you better than she is? Because if you're not bringing more than she is to the table, then what's the point? You know what I mean? If you're going in wanting to, to be validated and say, you know what? I too can manage this money. You know what I mean? Um, and you're doing exactly what she's doing. You're not adding anything extra. Then it wouldn't make sense for her to transfer it over to you so that you could feel good about yourself. You so, know? So... Um, you brought up a word that we talked about before. The word is validated. I don't think the word, I don't think that at the time I was trying to be validated. I think I was trying to uh, help and contribute. I think that's what I was trying to do. Um, validation means I'm trying to prove a point, not necessarily move in the right direction that we talked about before. I don't think that was, no, that there, that's not what I was trying to do. My intentions were to kind of take the load off her soldiers. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah, but was she complaining about the load? Was she, did she say she needed help? Was she, did she, was she falling short with things not getting paid? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, what, at what point, why did you think that she needed help? Well, also to answer your question, yes, yeah, she was complaining about the load being too big. Um, but I guess, I mean, I, I guess to me, when I think about it now, now, now situations over, I think that was a trust factor. I think that, she was in charge of the money for so long and I felt like I could help at that point and that I gotten better that I felt like the trust wasn't there for her to kind of delegate some of that to me. Even yeah, though she was come it would it would have to be it would have to be something that she asked you to do because in that yeah. point she's the one delegating. So mm -hmm. can you picture, you know, you're a principal now. Can you picture teachers coming up to you? and telling you how you should delegate everything that's going on. No, that's not going to Now that they got their master, like, I, I got my master degree now. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a PhD <laughs> now, so I can do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I'm the principal. So the reason why you take the leadership role is because they're trusting you to delegate. Mm -hmm. They're trusting you to ask for help when you need help, ask for support when you need support. 
So I think the question would have been if you should have went in asking it, what did she need to, for you to support? Yeah. Yes. To help her. That's all you know I mean. Getting, what yeah. did you need? What did you need for I me? Mean, what did she need from you so you can um, lessen the load? Not to come in and say, well, I got better, so I could do Let me take over, yeah. Let me, let me, let me do some, some, something to help you and support you. I think at that point, you got to be humble and ask, well, how could I support you? Because you are in the quote unquote superior role in that, in that situation. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think definitely, um, I, I'm, I definitely think where, where the situation with that, as far as that subject of money went, you know, went sour is definitely because. Um, at the time, I wasn't really willing to have that conversation as far as to sit down and ask for your help. I just tried to, I, I tried to come in and not say dominate, but I tried to come in and let her know that I can handle X, Y, and Z. And, and that's where the friction was. I think uh, that situation could have been handled differently if I was willing to sit down and have a conversation. Like, I, so, so I'm not, so in February, I wasn't able to admit this stuff that I'm saying to you right now. You know what I'm saying? Now that I'm, now that I'm a little bit better and, and I've gone through a little bit of a maturation. I'm, I'm able to have these conversations now. And so I, so I can say that too. In February, I wasn't the same person that I was able to be right now. And you know, you, so, Darrell, so for our viewers, Darrell, you know, we have the Let's Talk Relationships every Monday. Darrell is on every single Monday. He hasn't, I don't think, missed one yet, right? And we have these, talk, these conversations about relationships, obviously, because we're talking about relationships, right? Yeah. Um, and you often say that, like you, 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 you speak about how you were one person, you know, six People. months ago and you're a totally different person now. Right. Yeah. And when you, when we change, when we, even if we change for the better, right. Which is not a bad thing. Like, but we, we, we change for, well, it can be like, it, it may still hurt the relationship. But my question for you, Darrell, is like, you have a lot of, um, a lot of things come to you, it's coming to you, right? And you're able to admit certain things and you're maturing in certain areas. Yeah. Are you going back to your ex-wife and having those conversations? Are you saying to her, you know what? You were right about this and I was wrong? Because that's true growth. Like you could tell us, you could tell the viewers, you could tell our Let's Talk relationship panelists. You can tell everyone on the internet. And hope but that the, it gets back though. Yeah, but really like I think I do, I, I would recommend that you have that conversation with her. And based on the smile on your face, I don't think you are, but. Um, nah, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because it was like, that's a real question. I was sniffing like, no, she didn't, but no, nah, it's all good. <laughs> nah, I mean, um, as far as building it up, I mean, yeah, I've, I've had, um, I've had conversations with uh, her. Um, I've, I've been able to do that. So again, basically what I'm saying to you, and if there's any viewers that's been in my situation, um, sometimes you're not able to admit your wrongs or try to move forward at a certain time of your life. So again, answer your question. Yes, I've had, I've had, had conversations with her. Um, and when I've had these conversations with her, like she looks at me a little bit different. Um, like I said, I mean, the change, the maturation, sometimes it takes days, weeks, months, whatever the case may be, but I've had, had these conversations with me. The way those conversations have happened is basically how she feels is, okay, why could he be? Why couldn't he have done this six or seven months ago? You understand what I'm saying? Um, and sometimes, I mean, with me, it used to be, uh, I was, it was difficult to admit when I'm wrong in certain places. And I feel like now that I'm able to do that, I think things are different. Um, it's not to a point where I'm trying to get back together with her, but I am willing to say I was wrong or I was willing to say that I'm sorry. And, and I could have handled a lot of things differently. And again, that's just growth. That, that wasn't me six or seven months ago. I'm just being honest. Well, yes, and I, being an adult in the room, man. And I, yeah. Being an adult and that again, what you say? I said, welcome to being an adult in the room. Being an adult in the room is, is all about, you know, being accountable for where you might have went wrong, man. Like, sometimes we sit back and people tell us we went wrong in a certain aspect of life and we don't see it. We don't feel it. So we're not going to be disingenuous and say we see it when we don't see it. But it's going to break the relationship because they see it. So it doesn't matter if it's true or false. Once they see it and you don't see it, that's where the friction starts because right. both people need to be on the same page and see something that is actually breaking the relationship. She might have been right, you might have been wrong. And in this instance, I mean, I would say you was dead wrong. You know what I mean? Like there was a there was some growth and some 
you know, maturing that you need to do in that aspect, in the money aspect, and the, you know, letting her lead, or not really letting her lead, but obviously supporting her in her strength. I mean, there, there, there's a point that, because she's strong in something, should never make you feel weak. Yeah. And Jerry used the right word. I mean, validation is what you wanted. You know what I mean? This is your partner. This is somebody that you care about. So you want to let her know, I can support you too. And it wasn't anything wrong, and I don't think it was malicious. I don't think you was needy in the sense but you did it unconsciously. Mm -hmm. You stepped on her toes just because you wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. And if the relationship is not enough for you to be seen, that's where the friction happens because with her taking care of the money and making sure y'all in the best place possible financially, she's taking care of y'all. So yeah. you're already seen because she's made you a problem. No doubt. You get what I'm saying? Where, was, where would you say that, you know, you was the adult in the room and you feel she wasn't? Oh, um... So, I mean, I guess it kind of ties along with what I do for a living. I have no problem. So um, when things get, so to speak, like when decisions need to be made or if um, a lot of things are coming on at once, she was not very good with taking on that kind of a role to make a quick decision or make a decision for the better of us. Um, I think I was definitely good in that role with if multiple things were coming at us at once, I was able to navigate it. Like, think, like things don't rattle me much when I have to make multiple decisions at once because I'm used to that as far as my profession. I'm, I'm used to handling um, multiple things as far as management, supervising kids, things, you know, things like that. So if three, if three or four, so, so, I mean, so for an example, if three, if, say, say I'm in my school building and three or four things are going on at once, I'm not overwhelmed. I don't get overwhelmed easily. I'm able to kind of slow it down take it piece by piece and make quick decisions. She wasn't real good with that. So um, she definitely struggled in that area. And that's the and, and that's area. You gave us so. an example, like you gave us with the money situation, what would be an example of that? Um, I'm going to go a little extreme here. Uh, say there's a death in the family. Say our son needs something. Say, uh, you know, she's having a, a situation with one of her family members, like something like that. Three or four things going on at once. Um, she would get overwhelmed real easily and I'm able to slow it down and navigate on what's more important to handle. You know, as, as, as far as say four things come out at once and you obviously got to pick which is more important to handle first, second, third, fourth. I'm, I'm, I'm able to break that down and I'm able to decipher that. She would kind of struggle with that. She kind of would shut down, break down and, you know, something like that. But I'm able to kind of navigate it. Like, listen, this is the most important thing. This is the second most important thing. Third, fourth down the line. So I was, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good with that because of what. I was. And then what would she do? What would she do to, um, what would she do to undermine you in that area? Um, to call it what it is. I, I mean, I guess when she got overwhelmed with certain things, she would yell, curse, which we already know some of my triggers. Um, you know, things like that. Um, say, um, uh say I don't have any feeling about certain things or why am I doing it like this? And basically- So she would come at your character. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's basically what I'm trying to say um, because my character is more poised. I don't rattle under pressure. And I think a lot of that comes with playing sports growing up. She just, that just wasn't one of her strong points. So you felt that she, when it was time for you to lead, she didn't really take your leadership well. Sometimes um, I would say yes. Uh, she didn't. So well, sometimes I, it's always going to be. I'm just saying, was it happening? So like most times, like yeah. Was she able to take? Was she able to take you in most of the time? Um, I would have to sit down and think about that. Uh, what I was getting ready to say was, um, going into the situation before. So let's just kind of start a little bit back, so you can understand. Going into the situation with her, um, I won't say relationship, excuse me. Going to that re relationship with her, um, I walked into her being a single parent, her used to being in control of most situations, her being very dominant, and that, and that was her lifestyle. And on the flip side of that, I was also the same way. So at the end of the day, we had to, we had to come to some kind of compromise. So yes, when, when things hit the fan and, and it was time for me to step up, I think sometimes she didn't, I think she wanted to control. I think with her, most of the time, it, it, it was definitely more of a control thing. She wanted to control a lot. And I think that's where a lot of our friction started. 
and it started because you guys didn't have so you went in knowing that she was a single mother right um so was was there friction because you guys never really talked up like had that conversation about uh roles and responsibilities and when you guys decided to to take it to the next level i'm gonna go even deeper we went into it without having our foundations um uh you know addressed on, on what our foundations were that's 100 so you're just getting in when you fit in yeah absolutely i think now that i'm a little bit deeper into what we do as you know as y'all as love snobs and me as being a panelist every week um i always start there i always start at what are your foundations and i feel like if your foundations aren't set no matter what relationship you're trying to have it's not going to work and i think that was the number one thing with us we went into it trying to just go kind of I, I guess uh go as we can or you know just work it out and as as we thing as as it comes versus yeah and that's not a, plan, a proactive plan in motion right and, and when i sit about. down and think about that it's definitely that didn't that that you know it didn't work definitely that's why our first season was define our terms because yeah we think it's very important to sit down and identify the same definition for the same words so when we're speaking we have a clear understanding of what each other is talking about and we cannot say, well, I thought of it this way and you thought of it this way. We have a clear understanding and that's setting the foundation. So y'all should have had the same understanding of what commitment was, the same understanding of what leadership was, what it meant to lead in this area. Or are you stronger or are you weak in this area? Both people can be strong in an area, but one person is stronger. So it's counterproductive for the other person to find validation in that area. They have to find it in another portion of the relationship. Yeah, and if you guys are, if when you define your, when people define their terms, it helps set the expectations. No doubt. Because we both know what we, we, we both know that, like, if we believe that, if we believe that accountable love means this, right, and we can hold each other to that, you know what I mean? But if I, if you think accountable love means one thing, and I think accountable love means one thing, then we're never, I, you can't really hold us, you can't, you won't be holding each other to the same standard. And that, again, is the same word, right? But we won't be able to hold each other to the same standard. And that's going to breed resentment as well. So, yeah, it's really important to know, like, when you guys, when pe two people are connecting, it's really important to know that you guys are talking about the same exact thing. Definitely. Like, right. what exactly means to each other. Because it's, yeah, it's not called avoid conflict love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's called, it's called accountable love. So... You're gonna argue, I mean, for a lifetime. You gotta, when you sign up for a relationship, you gotta look at it like we're gonna have conflict for a lifetime. This is just the best person I feel that's going to allow me, allow, we're gonna work together to get over each conflict. You know, a relationship is only as strong as our ability to find solution. You know what I mean? Because once we don't find solution, it becomes a virus in your relationship. And then things start spiraling the control. But if you have somebody who's on the same page and the focus is solution, then things are different, which you actually obviously encounter, right? Um, yeah, I can also take it even deeper. I, I mean, so in her and I have had this conversation. I think um, going into when we decided that we wanted to get married, that we had two definitions of what marriage looked like. Mm -hmm. um, she had a definition of marriage that you know, was a lot different than what mine looked like. Um, well, give us so, these differences. Like, what was uh, your idea of marriage versus her? Small understanding these differences, man. Yeah. yeah, me. So I can just speak for me, and she wasn't perfect by a long shot. And neither was I. But I think with me, what definitely got me into it, what get me in trouble frequently is understanding that. So number one, what I'm saying to you is one of my core values or principles is family. Family first, right? That wasn't when, so I can definitely say when I was, to certain parts when I was married, I did not put my family first. I put things before the family, which obviously upset her, which obviously upset, like it messed the foundation up. And it took me so long to understand that. So I feel like when you put certain things, when your foundations and your principles aren't, aren't, uh, aren't established, Hello? It gets you in, it, like it, it, it gets you in trouble. So again, me just putting things in front of the family that once you get married, it shouldn't even be an option. Like it, it shouldn't even be a, a topic of discussion on why this is first. 
or why family is first. I think I think um me at the age of you know 30, 31, whatever the case may be, I don't think I was totally out of the same mode of single mode that I should have been. And that got me in trouble a lot. Definitely, but when we're asking you the question, we're asking you, what was your ideal? Like yeah. Well, you even like had you, a person to attach that ideal to. What was your idea of marriage? And then in speaking to her, what was her idea of marriage? Without my idea. even your, not without even having you involved, what was her idea of marriage? I mean, her I mean, I think her idea of marriage was, you know, just 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 family. We do things together. Everything we do is for the family. You know, decisions we make is for is 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 to either be for the family or better the family. Like she always put me first for the most part, for the most part. Um, like no matter what, like most of her decisions that she made, she tried to put the best interest of me and our son. I don't think I was always like that. I don't think all the decisions that I made, especially my first couple of years, I always included her or, 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 or um, the family. So to speak. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what you actually did in the marriage. I'm yeah. saying yeah. if you picture marriage, let's say now if you look at marriage, what will be the ideal? Because obviously yeah, ideal relationship. ideal is different than the reality, right? Yeah. So what will be your ideal of the marriage? Because I oh, think my. that's where the, the issue is, right? The visual outside of any human being even fitting that, what would be what you say a marriage should look like? Yeah, we, now, yeah. Um no, even then, I mean, back even, then, like, and well, we could start with back then, and and then we can kind of go into how that changed your view about marriages now. But when before you were married, like, yeah, what were your thoughts on what your marriage should look like? I mean, I think okay, I think that's a great question. I think back then, my ideal of marriage is the same as it is now, but I think my actions displayed a lot different. Okay. I think that's the best way I can explain. So what that. was your idea? Give me, give me. Yeah, give us examples of what the ideals were. Um, an ideal marriage for me would be, I mean, two, the first and foremost, uh, putting God first in our relationship. That's number one for me. Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, us working together as one and not two individuals because okay. the individual should have left before we got married. Um, uh, yeah, God. So. Um, putting, you know, us working together as one. Um, number three would be um, making investments and doing things as a family to set ourselves up as, as, as far as wealth and money and things like that. Those are things that I definitely didn't take into consideration. Mm -hmm. and, and number four, uh, don't want to say starting a family, but um, continuing to build a family, meaning having more kids and things like that. So those are four things that I did not put into the account. Now, I knew going into marriage what it should look like, but the lifestyle, so that's the difference. The lifestyle I was living back then was not conducive to a marriage. Definitely. And you was now, you know, last time we was on Let's Talk Relationships, he was telling us you were dating. Does this person have the idea of what your ideal is when it comes to marriage? Your yeah, family, no doubt. Four codes. Um, she definitely does. Uh, she is on the same page, if not like so. I have what I, I yeah, see. The question yes, we're on the same page. We didn't yes. get that. What did you say? All right, you know, we had a little technical difficulties. Now we're back, you know what I mean? So we was sitting here talking about the rail and being a Adele in the room and it being in this marriage and being a Adele in the room. So, you know, we left off talking about you know, the new relationship you're in and are you talking about your four core foundations, the, the ideal marriage with the new person that you're dating? Yeah, we were, um, yeah, and answer that question. Yeah, we're on the same page with that. I think um, the difference is, you know, when I first, you know, when, when, when uh, her and I first started talking, I think that's, that's one of the first things that we actually sat down and talked about. That's one thing we didn't do when I was, uh, um, with my old, uh, you know, my ex-wife. So I think, you know, the guy, and actually she actually came to me with it. Um, she came to me and told me what her foundation were and, and, she, and what her principles were. And basically I had to step up and meet that. So that that was one thing that was different. But um, we definitely sat down and within the first couple of days of us talking, she definitely let me know what, what, like, what she was about 
what she was willing to tell, excuse me, what she was willing to deal with, what she wasn't willing to deal with, exactly. and how she wanted to be moving forward. So that was definitely a change. So she was, she was, she was, she was ready for the long term, and she was letting you know that I'm not settling for anything that's not. No right. doubt, one hundred percent. And a person that's not fully committed to what we're trying to build. One hundred percent. Actually, start. Is this the person that's too shy to get on the? Come on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She um. And and she listens every week. She's always tuning in every week. I think she, I believe she shares it every week. You just, you know, what I mean, she don't want to reveal herself. She's not. Uh, she's definitely not uh, shy speaking, but she's camera shy. Yeah, okay. but she could be on the panelist. She doesn't have to be. No, she could be on the. On the sorry, side. she could be on the side. She could still be like she could still register to Zoom, and she could be on the side and type in her comments as opposed to being a panelist. Definitely, she doesn't have to be on. Yeah. So again, I'll have this conversation with her. And I'll... So we're back. Darrell relocated. So I hope that you know the internet is better where you are. Um, but we're gonna get right to it about the question. You know, now that you are dating someone new, how have what are the, some of the things that you put in place to make sure that you guys are on the road to a healthy relationship? Yeah, I mean the first thing that you have to do that we talked about is um putting ourselves into a situation where we're talking to people who are experts on relationships. And um, one thing we do faithfully every Monday is, is listen to the Love Smiles every Monday. There's a new topic that I hear and build on each week that I try to, you know, use for the week. And, and, and if I can take the time to spread the word to other people, then I try to do that. Yes, yes. Yeah, we appreciate your participation. I think, I think you just said a very valuable thing. And a lot of, you know, a lot of experts in relationships, therapists, um, life coaches, things of that nature, have the same issue. People come to them when it's a little too late. Yeah. And not when they're starting the new relationship. And a lot of people, you know, like, yeah, it's cool that you start the relationship and there's two people and it's between two people. But, you know, it's really important to make sure you get counsel in the beginning of the relationship if you're truly invested. So you at least know where you're going, where you want to be, and you know the right questions to ask. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people wait till they have the problems to actually start coming and getting some services. But it's very important, I think, when you're in a healthy place to actually see how to maintain that health for a lifetime, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's awesome. a very important thing. So we do think that what you're doing is great. And, you know, we're glad that you was on. You know, we're glad that you came. And set aside some time to you know have a discussion and join the Accountable Love podcast. You know our aim is to make everybody love snobs, and really to take you know relationships very serious. Even if you have fun in them, even though, though you enjoy them, you know be serious about the things that help them, help the foundation stay firm, and 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 you can enjoy everything else a lot more and a lot greater. Yeah, and being comfortable and being comfortable getting support throughout. Like as you said, it's not a, like you don't wait till the problem is so blown out of proportion that you're desperate now, right? I, and you're you're seeking help for to 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 just survive. You know, you want to live. We want to live. We want to live with with the people that we're building with. So it's really important that it's something that we know that we need support throughout. Yeah, and no. it's Go ahead. Ahead. I no. Go ahead. No. So it's really important that we we acknowledge that. I think we are conditioned or we're taught that we don't need any help. You know what I mean? We're taught that we can get through this by ourselves or we can roll with the punches or when the problems arise, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But if you are proactive and get to it before it becomes something crazy, your chances of surviving that relationship in a healthy way is greater than if you don't deal with it at all. Definitely. So we would like to thank Darrell again. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, we thank you, Darrell. And another discussion on the Accountable Love podcast, you know, so. And you can catch the role on, uh, wait, well, you can catch the role on Let's Talk Relationships. He's on every Monday. We're on every Monday. We talk about a new relationship top topic. If any of our viewers have any topics that they would like us to discuss, you know, you can always inbox us. Um, but again, we're here every Monday. If you want to be a guest, let us know. If you want to see where about, check out our webinar on Mondays. Definitely. And we have another, we have a new, a new, um, web U URL, that's what it's called, a new URL, you know I'm old now. But we have, it's, it's, less, it's Love is a Group Journey, 
Love.com. We're not accountable. Love no more.com. We love as a group journey.com. So, you know, come visit the website. We have everything on the website. We have relationship building services for whoever needs support. We have, you know, we have um, blogs, we have blogs, podcasts, we have podcasts, we have webinars, we have things of that nature. So, you know, join the discussion. We want you to, you know, get education or get informed about relationships the best way you can. So, you know, enjoy. And again, thanks to all for participating today. No, thank you all and for And every Monday. Me. I'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you for having me. All right. No Bye. Take care.